Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to the 11th J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture of our institute. At the Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics, we have a tradition of hosting three memorial lectures, the Shah Memorial Lecture, the J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture, and the Ramanujan Lecture. So this is in uh, honor of the famous scientist as well as biophysicist, Professor J.C. Bose. In the past, this memorial lecture has been delivered by many distinguished scientists, including many Nobel laureates. Today, it is my privilege that we have with us Professor Mariano Barbasit from, uh, from the Spanish National Cancer Center as our guest to deliver this prestigious lecture. He is one of the first sci uh, scientists to isolate a human oncogene, by which I mean a gene that causes cancer, which is a disease almost taking the dimensions of an <coughs> epidemic as of today throughout the world. Now I request our director, Professor Ajit Kumar Mahanti, to please come on stage and welcome our speaker and also introduce him. Professor Ajit Kumar Mahanti, please. In 2012, he was inducted to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences 
As a foreign member, and in 2014, he was elected fellow of the American Association for Cancer Research. He holds many honorary degrees from different universities. His work has also been recognized by several international and domestic awards, including the Steiner Prize in 1988, Ibsen Prize in 1994, King Juan Carlos One Award in 1984, Brookbeer Cancer Research Prize in 2005, the Medal of Honor of the International Agency for Cancer Research in 2007, and the Bukit Medal of Dublin in 2017. In 2011, he was awarded an endowment chair from the AXA Research Fund, Paris. He is in the scientific, as expected, he is in the scientific advisory committees and boards of many agencies and research councils for several years in Europe. So with this quick introduction, I now request Professor Barbeshi to deliver the Jesibus, 11th Jesibus. Not necessarily fasting, 
plant is regulated for. But beyond that, there are more than 150 different diseases based on the type of cell and the type of organ in which they originate. And now, over the last decade, we, uh, there have been a technical development that allows a massive sequence. And this uh, new development has allowed to sequence thousands of cancer genomes. And this not only has provided a very detailed molecular map of the disease, again, even if you see how I make a mistake and talk about the disease rather than diseases, um, but also we have learned two very basic concepts. The first is that cancers harbor thousands of mutations. I have to tell you that uh, 1982, when we found the first mutation involving human cancer in collaboration with my good friend, uh, friend Kumar Reddy, uh, we knew that one mutation was not enough. It was not enough to cause cancer. In fact, in those days, uh, we knew that this particular oncogene that we had isolated could only transform cell in cells but cannot transform, do not transform normal cells. The following year, the laboratory of Robert Weinberg, who also isolated the gene, we published back to back the, 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 the discovery of the rash oncogene, found that putting together two oncogenes, he was able to transform normal cells. And at that time, the scientific community felt relieved but they said, okay, now we understand cancer. You need two genes. The combination of two genes to transform normal cells. Well, as you will see today, we were extremely naive because there are not two, nor even ten, nor even hundred genes. There are many genes that participate in cancer development. So, the other thing we learned is that by comparing these thousands of cancer genomes that have been sequenced today, no two are identical. So we can say now, with all the information we have at the molecular level, that each cancer is unique. Now, the question then is, does this mean that each cancer patient will have to be treated differently? That's probably not realistic at least uh, in today or in the next, uh, you know, maybe even 50 years. Uh, but for sure, the future of cancer therapy will have to be based on some sort of personalized medicine that can be had to be adjusted to the uh, mutational load of each particular patient. So. Obviously, this is going to be very complicated. So, the question is, would it be possible to devise other therapeutic approaches that may serve to treat maybe not thousands of patients, but at least groups of patients in a way independent of their mutational load? And one of the ways that this could be achieved, and I will discuss this a little a little bit more left at the end of the talk, is the possibility of manipulating or regulating the patient's immune system so tumors are not allowed to escape immunosurveillance. Okay? But I'll get back to this uh, a little bit later. So let me tell you a little bit about cancer incidence and mortality. Um, um, everywhere in the world, um, during the last two, three decades, we have witnessed a significant increase in cancer incidence. There are some cases might be due to pollution, to, uh, I mean, many things have been blamed. But in fact, the reason why there's more cancer is for a good reason. It may sound silly what I just said, but it's a good reason. It's because we live longer. And uh, cancer increases exponentially with age. So the older we get, the older society gets, the more cancer we are going to have. No question about it. 
Some people say that if we were all to live 150 years of age, we would all die of cancer. Well, at least we will all have cancer when we die, which is not the same thing. Okay? Now, at the same time, during these two, three decades, we have also witnessed a significant decrease in mortality. But this has not been uniform. We have seen a significant decrease in mortality or a significant increase in survival, whatever, whichever way you want to present it, in hematological tumors, in pediatric tumors, and in hormone-dependent tumors, that is, in breast and in prostate. In fact, let me show you this graph, where you can see how, for instance, child with leukemia or childhood lymphoma, they are in the range of 90% survival. Now, for those of you who are not in the cancer world, let me tell you that the way cancer survival is measured is survival for five years, counting the time from the time you are diagnosed with the disease. So this is not being cured. We don't measure cures in cancer. We measure survival. So you can see this is in the European Union in 2014. Adult lymphoma is not as good, it's about 62%. Okay? Hormone-dependent cancers, breast, and prostate, they are also in the range of 90%. Now this is this uh, classification is by organ of origin. Now for instance, in breast cancer, that is a type of cancer, breast cancer called triple negative. Survival there is only 50%. So that means if we eliminate those tumors, the survival for breast cancer sir, is well over 90%. Okay? So there's a very good news. And for prostate, for the mayors in the audience, they say, they have a, a saying that we will all die with prostate cancer, not of prostate cancer. So that we all will have our prostate somehow uh, altered, but that is not going to kill us for a very small percentage of people. Now colon, as you can see, is uh, pretty good also, in part because now uh, colon has become an external organ. So basically, although not pleasant, you can have a colonoscopy, and then the doctor can remove little polyps that come up, and therefore you are clean. Uh, and people over 60 should have a colonoscopy every two years, and if you have some familial uh, 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 cases of colon cancer maybe every year. Okay. But as a scientist, uh, you know, we should not look at the past accomplishments. We should look at the challenges that are ahead of us. And as such, what I look is at these tools. Again, brain is a really not a very well defined uh, cancer because there are many types of uh, brain tumors and this 27% is misleading because there is a tumor type called glioblastoma multiforme that the survival rate is less than 4%. So there is big variation in brain, this is just the average of all brain tumors. But if you go down the list, you have liver, you have lung, then you end up with pancreas. Pancreas also a type called adult, uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the most frequent type of human uh, pancreatic tumor, is also less than 4%. So this is where we have to focus, uh, because this is where the challenges are. So in general, uh, the advances, uh, the improvements in survival that I mentioned to you have not come from just having a better medicine. And as an example, uh, I can use antibiotics and infection diseases. Okay, antibiotics, the, the, the discovery of antibiotics completely, almost completely eradicated infection diseases. Okay. Um, this has not been the case of cancer. It's not like we have a drug or medicine one, medicine two, medicine three, and that is really being responsible for this. There are many medicines, medicines, no question, but the improvements have really been derived from the management of the disease. From better diagnostics, that is very important. Better surgical procedure, if the tumor is 
not a spread, it's not metastasized. The only one that will cure it is the surgeon. No question about that either. And also better public awareness. This is very important. The people are they, they, they should not be hypochondriacs, but they should be aware. And if you or a lady notices a little bump in the breast, or you notice a little bump anywhere, or you find something that you think is not normal, go quickly to the doctor. Because if you are able to identify that you have a tumor before it has a spread, that can be cured. And even if it has to spread a little bit, certainly your chances of being cured are much higher when the tumor is not progressed, and certainly when the tumor is not metastasized. So at the same time, and ironically, during the last two decades, we have witnessed a complete revolution in the nature and properties of the new anti-cancer drugs. Until 1998, all anti-cancer treatments were based on cytotoxic compounds. These cytotoxic drugs are non-specific. They kill basic processes in the cell, like DNA synthesis or mitosis, but they kill normal cells the same as they kill tumor cells. Okay. Now, so how can we use it? Well, some of these drugs have what they what we call a therapeutic window. In other words, they kill tumor cells a little bit better than normal cells. This is totally empirical. We do not know at all the molecular basis for this therapeutic window. Uh, we used to have a Bristol Myers lessons of taxanes. And they all had the same mechanism of action in the, in the laboratory, in the petri dish. Yet in the clinic, only paclitaxel and doxitaxel could be used. The others were too poisonous. They could not be. They didn't have a therapeutic window. And then there is also this misconception that tumor cells grow very fast, much faster than normal cells. And that's why these compounds work better than normal cells and tumor cells. This is not the case. I mean, in fact, we have hematopoietic cells, our cells in the blood, our cells in the intestinal tracts. They grow by far faster than tumor cells. Okay. Obviously, that explains also why these cells are more susceptible to the toxicity. You know, we all know about neutropenia. We all know about intestinal problems uh, when we receive these drugs. But anyway, in any case, the, the, the point, the message that we need to, to, to take with you today is that we have no idea why cytotox some cytotoxics work in the clinic and others that have exactly the same mechanism of action in other. So, but in any case, that's not a uh, uh, promising line of research okay, for the young people here because these uh, <coughs> medicines are not the medicines of the future. They are still used in the clinic. In those cases, we have no better, no better molecules, no better drugs, but they are certainly no longer considered to be optimal therapies. Since 1998, most, if not all, of the newly approved anti-cancer drugs are selective inhibitors of proteins directly implicated in the process of tumor development. The first one, historically, was a monoclonal antibody developed by Genentech that was directed against the tyrosine protein binding receptor in part 2 that is overexpressed in a subset of breast cancer. Okay. This molecule is now uh, antibody is called receptin, the molecule the uh, commercial name is Rastuzuma. Okay. And then, historically also, it took another three years for the first chemical molecule, a small molecule, to go to the clinic. This one it was called Imatinib, the commercial name is Gleven. It was approved for the treatment of chronic myeloid or leukemia, a mild type of cancer caused by a chromosomal rearrangement that creates an oncogene that we know as able, we see as able. Uh, and this is a very selective, rather selective inhibitor. You will never hear me to say the word specific. Selective is the best, the best I can say. So, this change in paradigm, you know, Americans, they like to uh, uh, always have a new initiative. So, 
this has been going on for 20 years, I said. The first was not as targeted therapies, the later was not as personalized medicine, and now it's known as precision medicine. In my opinion, if you ask me a little bit of the topos name, because I don't think it's so precise, especially being in front of uh, physicists, there's not much precision here. But anyway, it's a new initiative that was signed into law by President Barack Obama on about three years ago. So this is now the name that we use, precision medicine. However, we have to be humble and we have to admit that precision medicine so far has had only a limited impact on the overall survival of cancer patients, especially those with aggressive, advanced, or metastatic tumors. And in fact, you might want to read about this in New England Journal of Medicine, this about uh, again a half ago in this uh, <coughs> commentary. But the physicists, I'm sure you're not familiar with the New England, uh, but I'm sure you're familiar with something called nature. So you can you can also read there this article that I think the title says it all: the precision oncology illusion. A little bit too critical, but worth reading. So the question is why is precision medicine? not being so precise, not being so effective. There are many reasons. I only listed here six, which I think in my personal opinion are the most important. So let me take you through them, at least to uh, five of them. Uh, as I said already, uh, advanced cancers have many more mutations than we ever predicted. Let me show you a graph that I think is very telling. The uh, red line is the average of the mutational load of each of the columns. Each column represents a tumor type. That's a matter of the names of the tumor types. You can see that the average is pretty much, there's a little bit out of line, but it's pretty much one. One means because it's one mutation per mega, per mega base, our genome has three times 10 to the 9, so that means 3,000 mutations per tumor. And the range goes between 1,000 and 10,000. That's a lot of mutations. In fact, in those tumors in which we contribute to the tumor, that means by tumors, people that smoke, bladder cancer, lung cancer, or people that are exposed, too much exposed to sun, melanoma, the number of mutations can go up to 30,000. So, the question then is, First obvious question is, are all the mutations involved in cancer? I have good news for you, they're not. Many of them are probably in this selfish DNA, the DNA that we don't know what function it has. Okay. However, um, I mean, only those mutations that create one way or another cancer genes are obviously the ones that we have to deal with. Now, what is a cancer gene? You see, a very loose definition, cancer genes are those genes that upon mutation or after some sort of genetic alteration become either non-physiologically activated, those we call them oncogenes, in other words, they acquire more activity than their normal status, or they are inactivated, and then we call them tumor suppressors. Inactivated, they can be inactive, you see a case now, or they can be just simply eliminated, deleted. Or they could be uh, transcriptionally silenced by a genetic mechanism. So as a consequence of this new physiological alteration, either too much or too little, they contribute to either tumor initiation, tumor progression, or both. So that is the first problem. We have to deal with a lot of it. Not one or two, as we thought naively in 1983, but too many more. The other problem is most cancer genes cannot be easily targeted. Okay? And therefore, as a consequence, we have developed, we, meaning the pharmaceutical industry, has developed very few <coughs> drugs against these targets. Let me show you, this is a very, uh, I think, very illustrative uh, uh, of 5,000 tumors. If you go to the y-axis, the uh, higher you go means that a particular cancer gene 
has been frequently mutated in a particular tumor, even if that tumor is not very big. Let's say that it's a very unusual, very rare tumor, there are only 50 cases in the world a year. But this particular cancer gene has been mutated in 45% of them. I'm sorry, 45 of the 50. That gene will appear very high in the y axis. Now, the x axis represents how frequent that particular tumor is. So, this tumor with only 50, 50 cases a year will be very much to the left. And if you have breast cancer or, or, or colon cancer, it will be very much to the right. So now each dot represents a cancer. Obviously, this one here, that is not even a space to put them the name, this would be maybe scientifically very interesting, but certainly they are not important from a health point of view, because they're just rare events. Okay? It might be even considered rare diseases. Obviously, what, from a health point of view, what we are interested in is this one. Now let me amplify this. If you take the time to tell them, I think they are 33. So the question is, okay, we are now in a time where we can go to the moon, where we can, uh, you know, do fantastic things that we never dream about. I mean, 33 is not so many. How come that we, a super civilized world, cannot make drugs against just 33 targets? So the answer is that because of most of them are not drugable. And this is a, a term that basically means that we are not smart enough to design drugs against them. Okay, now, that may be a, a too humble of an experience. You can also say we don't have the knowledge today or the means to design drugs against them. Now, let me give you an example for those of you who are not in this uh, world of cancer. This is P53. P53 is the tumor suppressor most frequently <coughs> mutated in human cancer. More than half of the tumors that occur in the world today have a mutation in P53. So how come we cannot develop a drug to prevent this cancer gene from causing us cancer? Let me tell you, P53 is a transcription factor that senses the stress caused, caused by DNA damage. DNA damage or DNA error. It doesn't even have to be DNA damage. DNA error. Every time a cell divides, you have to copy 3003 times 10 to the 9 letters. Let me tell you what is amazing is that nature can do that because it is a really complex process. But I won't go into that. So, uh, P53 uh, senses the stress caused by DNA errors and decides whether the cell should stop proliferation and repair them. Same way you get a flat tire, you stop the car and you change the tire. Or if it's too severe, then decide whether the cell should die of apoptosis. Like if your car breaks every day, you decide to throw it away and then so. So, this is a, a diagram that uh, tells you uh, what I just said, that if there are few uh, errors, the P53 activates a transcriptional program that stops the cell from proliferating and allows each time to the cell to proliferate. I mean, sorry, to, to, to fix this problem. But if you realize that there are too many, so there's no way the cell is going to repair this, then just activates another set of, of, of genes, and those genes are involved or induce apoptosis. Okay. So, what happens when you don't have P53? You don't sense it. So you keep accumulating mutations, you never prepare them, and you never die of apoptosis because you don't know you have so many mutations that you should die of apoptosis. Okay. So, okay, why we can't uh, repair P53 activity. Well, P53 is inactivated either by division, if you don't have it, possible to repair, or 
more frequently by mutations that inactivate this ability to bind to DNA. Obviously, a transcription factor doesn't bind to DNA, usually. Okay. So today, with all the advances that we have in 2018 in our world, and including, you know, this is a, that you by far more sophisticated than we are, there is not sufficient computer power or computer-based information to design a small molecule that will reverse the conformational change that takes place in the mutant P53 molecule and make that molecule be able to bind back to DNA. So, as simple and as humbly as that, we don't have sufficient computer power, therefore we still don't know how to do it. So basically, this is what I mean when I say that P53 is not a trackable target. So in fact, of these 33 uh, cancer genes, the entire power of the pharmaceutical industry and all the millions of dollars that they spend every year, during the last 20 years, they have only been able to generate selective inhibitors against tuberculosis. BRAP, kinase, serine triadine kinase, and the EGR receptor, the tyrosine protein kinase receptor. One is mutated in about 15% of lung tumors, and the other one, BRAP, is mutated in about 60% of all melanomas. But only two out of 33 in 20 years. That's a bad so let me move to the next. Patients develop resistant practice. Because up to now, patients are only treated with a single drug at a time. That is clearly a mistake. Obviously, this is not done because physicians are not smart enough, but because if they use combinations, they're too toxic, even though these molecules are much better than the classical cytotoxins that I mentioned before. They still are toxic. Won't we'll labor any more of that. That would make it too much fun. Now, how do they develop resistance? I could have, when I prepared this talk, I, I thought about explaining some mechanisms. But then I decided to follow the Chinese proverb that an image is worth a thousand words. So here you have a patient with spread metastatic melanoma. This patient probably will not live over a year. And then I don't have to explain to you with the, with the melanoma. Now this gentleman was treated with specific, uh, not use the word, selective inhibitor of b a molecule called bemudafinib. Okay. And in a month, the gentleman looked this way. I think you could say this is almost a miracle. It's really worth personalized medicine. Okay. And that's now, a few months later, the gentleman went back to star one. Somehow, the tumor has developed resistance and it does no longer respond to bemudafinib or, for that matter, to any other BRAF. Now, the tumor uses other signaling factors to grow. Okay? This is a problem that we are facing. And then, last, but not least, I'll go to this other problem, is that I told you before that cancer is not a single disease, there are 150 diseases, but I could almost say the same thing for each tumor. Each tumor is not a tumor, it's a mixture of tumors. It's a compendium of different clones. And this is known now as intratumoral heterogeneity. It was really discovered only five or uh, six, six years ago by a young physician, physician scientist, Charles Schwanton, working at the uh, Royal Master in London. What he did it was relatively simple, like most things uh, after somebody discovered. Uh, instead of sequencing the tumor, just taking a small piece of the tumor, he decided to sequence different parts of the tumor. And I think you see them their preference, you know, R1, R2, R3, etc., etc. Et so he sequenced nine regions of the tumor. And what he found, with the same thing, over the same thing, or 
were very similar to what Charles Darwin found when he went to the Galapagos Islands. He found evolution. He found that starting from a single clone, now this tumor that looks like a piece of meat, if you want to call it that way, kind of a uniform mass, actually is a compendium of several different tumors. They all come from the same, but they have been adding mutations, adding mutations. Okay. And let me just tell you, for instance, what are the consequences of this. I think I'm pretty obvious, but let me just labor a little bit. Let's say we have a drug against this tumor suppression called E10. We don't have it, but that's for the sake of argument. Let's think we have a fantastic drug against this cancer gene. So, if we give it to the patient without knowing that the patient has a tumor out, you know, the name, we would be curing region R3, R6, and R9. This region. This part of the tumor. But the rest of the tumor couldn't get less because it doesn't have any mutation. So, we'd only cure 50% of the tumor out. The other 50% would continue growing. Eventually, will expand the other tissue. So, be effective, effective in treating this individual. We'll have to use inhibitors against these two mutations that are the initiating mutations or very early mutations, and therefore they are in the entire. But to know this is very difficult. This is something that doctors cannot tell by just taking a biopsy. Because they're taking a biopsy, by definition, just, just taking one part of the tumor, by taking a biopsy from region R4 or from region R6, and not get the whole picture of what that particular tumor is. So the same way the cancer is not a single disease, the tumor is not a single tumor. And this is not unique to kidney tumors, not one found in a large fraction, in a large majority. So, getting to this point, uh, we have to conclude that this precision medicine is significantly better than classical chemotherapy. Yet, precision medicine needs to adapt some conceptual changes to provide one to leave the advances in cancer. First of all, and for the chemists in the audience, or at least the medicinal chemists in the audience, many, they need to expand the repertoire of targets. Now, Almost uh, medicinal chemistry is limited to ion channels and to kinases, if I may simplify. Okay. We need to block protein-protein interaction, and here where the structural biologists play a very important role. We need to understand better the structure of proteins so we can block protein-protein interaction. Or even better, negron chemistry. Negron chemistry is a new chemistry that tries to uh, 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 Maybe degradation process, uh, physiological degradation process based on the ubiquity system to eliminate proteins, not just to uh, inhibit them, but to eliminate them. Anyway, this is all in the hands of chemistry. Then, that we should pick targets that are essential for the tumor cells, but not for normal cells. Okay? That's pretty obvious. Then the target, I already mentioned, must be essential for all the cells in the tumor. <coughs> based on the intratumoral epidemiology. And then, again, this is motherhood and apple pie, but it's important that I mention targeted drugs must be as few, must have as few as possible of target effects uh, to prevent undesired hemorrhagic uh, toxicities. With the ultimate goal of learning from HIV, you may remember HIV was uh, pharmacologically uh, contained when a uh, uh, scientist decided to use drugs against the three genes of the HIV, combining three independent, separate drugs. Only then we are preventing HIV from being smarter than we are and developing resistance. The same concept needs to be applied to cancer. We have to treat, inhibit three, four, five signaling, different signaling pathways at the same time to outsmart the tumor and not allow the tumor to have the opportunity to develop a system. And now to finish the last five or so minutes, I'm 
going to address this question. Okay, we already talked about personalized medicine, but the question now, after I gave you all the um, difficulties in, in having a, a, sorry, a precision medicine, I'm sure that you're thinking, well, after what this guy is telling us, I can find an option because it looks like uh, precision medicine is not so precise. So, the answer is yes, and this is what is now very hot in oncology, in oncology, clinical oncology. And this goes back to a very simple question that I'm sure you ask yourself. If tumors are so different from normal tissues, how come that our immune system does not recognize tumors as foreign entities? the same way you recognize boring the virus or the bacteria, and then you check it. Well, it has been known for many years that tumors, one of the properties of tumors, is to evade immune surveillance. But then how do they do it? During many years, immunologists have tried to fight cancer by potentiating the immune system. They, they thought that the reason why the immune system could not fight cancer is because it was weak. It was not strong enough. So when, for instance, uh, in a cytokine were discovered, IL-2, some of you may remember Steve Rosenberg, who was famous not for this, but famous for the general press, because he was the personal doctor of Ronald Reagan. He, he, he treated people with IL-2. This is so toxic that only very young, good health cancer patients could tolerate. This is not the way to really fight, make our uh, immune system recognize fight tumors by, by, by making it more active. Because the game at the end attacks it. Okay? It's not a very different mechanism, the same result as like the box drugs. So what has happened in the last decade is that immunologists or some immunologists have realized that at least some tumors evade immune surveillance by borrowing, by mimicking physiological mechanisms used by the body to deactivate the immune system. This is something probably you're not in the field, you don't think about it. But if you have an infection, you, 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 you activate your immune system to fight the infection. But when the infection is gone, what happens to the immune system? The immune system becomes deactivated because otherwise you will eventually develop an immune disease. So, you know, you, you tend to think, okay, we have a problem, I fight the problem. But what happens after the problem has been resolved? You have to go back to normal. So, the immune system has as many mechanisms to fight disease as to become deactivated after it has conquered the disease. Okay? This is important. I, mean, I emphasize this because it's something I personally didn't think about until very recently. So these mechanisms now are known as immune checkpoints. And let me, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about two of them, because these are the only two that have shown to have clinical utility as of today. One is called CTLA-4, and the other is called PD-1 and pd one PD-1 is the receptor, the other is the light. Okay. So based on these studies, now immunologists, and I will just show you a cartoon that we probably be uh, uh, easier to understand, have developed monoclonal antibodies against these molecules responsible for controlling the immune checkpoint. So basically what the antibody does is to inhibit the molecule that inhibits the, 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 the immune system. So basically we are inhibiting the inhibitor. So there were these molecules, the role is to block and activate the immune system and make it return to normal. Okay. And that's what the tumor does. So we are now trying to outsmart the tumor by blocking this inhibitor. So we are inhibiting the inhibitor. Let me just show you this in the graph. Okay. So immune cells, some immune cells, I won't even tell you which one, not immune What they do is their responsibility is to inhibit the immune system after the immune system has fought the disease, uh, an infection disease. So the immune cells 
expresses these molecules, PD, PD, uh, L1 and B7.1, to block two receptors that are expressed in the cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells are the ones that attack the invader. Okay? And those are PD1 in one case, and the other is CTLA4. So what they do now is they stop this chili T cell because we don't need them anymore. We don't want to have them around. You don't want to have cytotoxic T cells going around your body once you already uh, have defeated the infection. So now what the tumor cells, very smart tumor cells, what they do is they copy this. And now they express these molecules, these very same molecules, EDL1 and B7.1. And now they inhibit the immune system. So they bypass the immune surveillance. Now this is explained in very simple terms, simple enough for me to understand. But I hope I hope they, 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 they give you an idea of how smart tumors are and how tumors evade in a surveillance. This is not the only mechanism. This is the only mechanism that has been found so far that has clinical clinical ability. So what are they doing in pharma now? Scientists are like. Now they are developing monoclonal antibodies capable of inhibiting this in inhibitory immune checkpoint. So for instance, the first one is an antibody called Imumab, developed by my old, old company, just on my script. Then two came from Merck, American Merck, and Bristol Myers, Nevo, and Pembroke. And now more recently, there have been three monoclonal antibodies against the EDL1. They all pretty much do the same, uh, Nevo and Pembroke being the best, okay, right now. All differences. Now, obviously, every pharmaceutical company want to have their own portfolio. So, in fact, what they do now is inhibit the inhibition of the T cell lymphocytes, and now the patient has circulating cytotoxic T cells that are capable to target the tumor. Okay. Now, is it so simple? Well, this is just a list of uh, indications that we approved. Okay. The best success was in metastatic melanoma. Metastatic melanoma is a disease that, as you saw before, with memurafenib resistance immediately, and before that there were basically no therapy. Some interferon-based therapy that really did, did more, more, more harm than good. What this uh, diagram shows is every vertical line is a patient. If it goes above the baseline, means the tumor is progressing. If it goes below, the tumor is progressing. And the ones on the right end, they go all the way to minus 100%. These are people that have no longer tumor. And this cannot be detected. So usually in the clinic, 30% regression is considered good response. So you can see that more than half of the people respond. And these responses are long responses, more than five years. And they have not, uh, their resistance is by far less frequent than with, uh, than with personalized or, or precision medicine. Very few or few uh, resistance. And now they are coming up, but after five years. So certainly not a few months, as I showed you before with the Buddha. So this is really a fantastic advance in cancer treatment. The only problem is not for all cancer, it's only for melanoma. And even within melanoma, some patients do not respond. What is the second best tumor to be treated with this immune checkpoint antibodies? The second best is the squamous lung carcinoma. You can see it's not as good. In this case, uh, at a year after, uh, this is called overall survival, so uh, this represents overall survival at the year after diagnosis. If the patients have been treated with the cytotoxic drug, 24% are still alive. The people treated with this immune checkpoint, 42% are alive. And with clinicians like best is the right part of the graph. That seems like there is a percentage of patients, around 30%, that have sustained responses. 
Now, the problem with this graph is that medical oncologists tend to see the glass half full. Scientists, we tend to see it the glass half empty. In other words, we are very happy for these 30% of people that are responding, but our eyes go to the left side of the curve when people do not respond. So why people, some people respond and others don't, when this is supposed to be a basic immunological mechanism? And the answer is that we have no idea, at least as of today. So, can immunotherapy replace precision medicine? Well, that's a question that don't have an answer now. It has advantages. It's very effective in certain patients. Longer effects with fewer resistances and tolerable toxicity. The few toxicities are related to autoimmunity, as you can imagine. However, it's not free of problems. The limitations, as I just mentioned, it's only affecting limited number of tumors. Pancreatic tumors, no effect. Glioblastoma, no effect. Uh, most breast cancer, no effect. Um, and, and so forth and so forth. The other problem is we, there are no biomarkers. Biomarkers is a very important area these days in cancer research. Because biomarker should tell you who will respond and who will not. This is critical. You really give that patient the right medicine. So right now, there are no biomarkers. So I go to the tumor tissue, that will be a great advantage because that will eliminate a lot of the undesired toxicity. I was talking this morning with the director about the use of radiation, which is also another way of treating cancer. I didn't mention radiation today, but radiation also has a lot of toxic effects. They are able to devise ways are obviously totally uh, unknown to me that only the tumor is targeted um, then uh, radiation will be uh, uh, fantastic to treat cancer but they have to be very selective there is no question that this is a very important line of research that is very active today I was just thinking this uh, immunotherapy, immune. So uh, it's a very good thing to know that your own immune system. So why, what is wrong if I can give a drug so that I can enhance my immune system at very high as and when required? And uh, it should, uh, you said that it may not work on many other cancers, is it? You've got the question. So if I increase the immune system, say I give something and my immune system I, I, I instead of concentrating on the cancer cell, I concentrate on the soldiers, how to increase the population. Well, um, let me first tell you, I'm not an immunologist, so you have to bear with me. But based on the experience of Steve Rosenberg, if you increase your immune system, that may actually attack, end up attacking your own normal tissues, and you lose the specificity. So it seems, it seems, and again, I'm only translating to you what the immunologists tell me, is that what you want with the tumor is to have a physiologically activated, active immune system for a long time. Not to have a big burst, because then the uh, 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 cytotoxic cells are going to attack your normal cells as well. This is what immunologists tell me. If they are wrong, I'm, gonna, I'm not responsible for it. So what they really want, and this is what is now fashionable and, and, and people are after, is to maintain, to maintain the immune response for a long time, but a physiological immune response. Whether they are right or not, um, this is what they are doing right now. Thank you very much. Reoccurrence of cancer cells. Is that related with resistance after treatment once? Well, obviously, uh, uh, reoccurrence, I mean, uh, is the main problem because 
um, uh, cancer drugs these days, uh, they do not get rid of the entire tumor. As I mentioned, only surgeons can do that, but that only surgeons can only remove the entire tumor if it has not spread. Once it has spread, surgeon is powerless. So tumor cells, I mean, sorry, anti-cancer drugs only kill a number of cells. And then the other cell, either because they are not very effective, because they don't reach in enough quantities, you know, we're talking about nanoparticles and ways to deliver, or because intratumoral heterogeneity, that some parts of the tumor will not respond to the targeted drug. Okay? So if you leave, I mean, this is a big problem with cancer that many other people don't understand. If you have high blood pressure or you have high cholesterol, all you have to do is to bring it below 200. You're healthy again. In cancer, you cannot kill 95% of the tumor. That's not sufficient. You have to kill 100% because if you leave 5% there, that tumor is going to come back. So that is the, one of the big issues in cancer, yeah. that you cannot leave a, a fraction of the tumor there because the tumor will come back, will regrow. And that's why most people with advanced cancer, even if they respond first, three, four, five years later, the tumor regrows and now it is resistant to that, to that treatment. And usually then, the, you know, all you have is palliative care. So that is one of the big problems with cancer. Thank you very much. I uh, now request our director to please come on stage and felicitate our speaker. Professor Mohanty, please.